second song, turn to page 799, America the Beautiful. They wrote the words to America the Beautiful, but poet Catherine Lee Bates and church organist Samuel Ward never met. The writer and the musician never even corresponded about the accidental collaboration that became one of the nation's sentimental anthems. Have implicit trust in God's faithful care and protection is never easy in times of danger and strife. Yet even in the midst of the terrible civil war between the northern and southern states, a remarkable woman named Julia Ward Howe proclaimed her confidence in God's triumphant power in the inspiring text written in 1862. Mrs. Howe's hymn has been acclaimed through the years as one of the finest patriotic songs. At one time, it was sung as a solo at a large rally attended by President Abraham Lincoln. After the audience had responded with loud applause, the president, with tears in his eyes, cried out, sing it again. Of his terrible sweet 
remain standing for our opening song, page 807. Men must be governed by God, or they will be ruled by tyrants. Moved deeply by the desire to create a national hymn that would allow the American people to offer praise to God for our wonderful land, a 24-year-old theological student, Samuel Smith, penned these lines on a scrap of paper in less than 30 minutes. Yet even today, many consider My Country Tis of Thee their favorite patriotic hymn and call it our unofficial national anthem. Here we are, we're in the happiest church in all of the world. And isn't it wonderful to be with God here this morning? Can I hear an amen? This is your opportunity to give back to God for all the blessings that he's given to you. Would the deacons please stand? Our offering this morning that's going into the plates will be for the church offering for church budget. If you have other offerings that you so designate, you may use the church envelopes and, and put that on the envelope. The deacons will we bow our heads for prayer. Our kind of many Father, we thank you for the opportunity of coming apart, and we thank you for all the many blessings you've given to us. And may we now, as we give back to you, may you take this money and use it for your intended use. We ask in your name. Amen.
I would ask those who are able to kneel with me as we talk to our God this morning. O oh God, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, we come before you this morning seeking rest, seeking comfort, but mostly seeking a spiritual, a spiritual revival in our lives. We ask for an outpouring of your Spirit in our lives and in this church and in each of us as we minister and reach out to our community. We ask that as, you, as we worship this morning, that you will come into each of us. Send us out from this place with the glow that is contagious, that others that we come in contact will, will be drawn to the desire to be with you as well. Please be with those who are not here this morning. We think of Olin Withrow and many others. You know their various needs. Give them serenity. Give them peace. But mostly, dear Father, give them the love of your son, Jesus, that they may feel the warmth and security of your arms wrap around them. Bless Pastor Marvin as he speaks this morning. And while he speaks your words, give him and as well us a special blessing. We thank you for your promise and revelation. Behold, I come soon. We long for your soon coming. Amen. <laughs> We've celebrated in this country this week the freedoms and the liberties that we enjoy. But in the world of heartache and pain and suffering, there's truly only one thing that give us, can give us everlasting liberty and freedom, and that's the cross. Liberates 
That my soul was set free on a shame proclaim that a rugged cross is my statue. Perfect, Kathy. Thank you. That just that that song just sends chills and uh, beautiful song service, and uh, it's just good to be together on this holiday weekend. I see that a lot of people are gone visiting, and uh, we're sorry to to see that. But you know what? We're glad you're here. So. Good to be together. So I, uh, I have a confession. Isn't, isn't part of church about confession? I mean, um, you know, it is. So I, I hope you won't be too shocked. I do want to tell you, I want to affirm that in- Ingrid is my first love, my true love, my true love, okay? It's been over 42 years, and if she ever leaves me, I'm going with her. And so is Mutti, so you might as well stick it out, darling, okay? But are you ready for this? There is a distant second. There is a distant second. I spend a fair amount of time with this distant second, and I think uh, when you see the picture and see the real beauty, I think you'll understand. I have a, a picture for you. Beautiful, isn't she? Yeah. Yeah. You can see the beauty. I, I, I try to keep the bike looking really good, and, and I, I especially shined it up this day. Uh, this was at uh, the Deals Gap, the, the, the Tale of the Dragon uh, special photo op, and I had it really, really looking good because it, it's important to look good, don't you think? It's important to look good. but. Then there's always the part where the rubber meets the road. And uh, for a while, I was spending so much time keeping my bike looking good that I failed to pay any attention to the tire tread. And so I was coming home from the conference office one day on, on 680, just cruising along with traffic, 80 miles an hour. <laughs> if you drive on 680, you know that that's the cruising speed there. And uh, all of a sudden, I felt a bump, and the bike started to fishtail quite uncontrollably. And I started thinking and looking for a place to land or bail out, trying desperately to see if I could hang on to it. I noticed all the other traffic on 680 slowed down and moved over to the shoulder because I was taking up all the lanes. Back and forth and back and forth, not hitting the brakes, just hanging on, slowing down. And finally, I was able to bring it to a stop on the median, and uh, we, we did not go down. But I can tell you, that does wonderful things for your breathing, I won't say, I have some other things I could add, but (laughs) once in a while, God gets through soon enough to say, hold that thought. (laughs) But uh, it it was quite an experience. 
not one that I care to repeat anytime soon. Thankful that it was the rear tire and not the front tire. Could have had quite a different ending. But uh, that's why on my sabbatical trip all around the country, I had new tires put on not once, but twice during the trip. I don't, uh, I don't push it to the margins anymore. So, so how is your spiritual journey going? We try to look good. We want people to be Im- impressed with our church facility. We want people to be impressed with our church website, with our e-newsletter that Roy left me with. Thank you very much. Uh, trying to teach old dogs new tricks and, and all of this. And, and we, we have all of this trying to look good in our programs, in our, in our worship service, putting on a polished appearance and a polished performance. But how is it where the rubber meets the road? Or more importantly, where my life and God's plans intersect with the community. Let's pray. Father, today we want to ask you to guide us as we take our thoughts from looking outward into our effectiveness and and our, our impact upon the community. Today I want you to, by the gift of your Holy Spirit, bring our focus to look inward, to examine ourselves, to look at our journey where the rubber meets the road. Give us insight, give us courage to see what we need to see in Jesus' name. Amen. So for the past few weeks, I've been sharing stories and thoughts uh, from Jesus related to our our neighbors, loving our neighbors, loving them sincerely, been sharing that, been trying to challenge you to reach out. You know, it's, it's not enough to just come here every Sabbath morning, good as you all look, but you know, when we, when we walk out of here, what do you take with you? What do, you, do you have anything to share? Do you have anyone to, to share it with? What, what does God want to do to you, through you, in the rest of the week? I've been trying to encourage you, maybe even to reach out so far as to be a little out of your comfort zone. I think it would be good for us all to get out of our comfort zone. I believe that Jesus wants us to, to look further outside of our programs and and our church to reach inside the hearts of those that Jesus allows to come across our paths day by day. So many opportunities to talk to people. What are you you doing with it? I want today, however, to ask you to take some time to look inside. Rather than evaluate our church, which we need to do, rather than to evaluate our mission and our programming, which we we need to, I want to ask you to get a thorough spiritual. Get a thorough spiritual. How often should we get a physical? Doctor, how often should we get a physical? Every year or two. I like the way you think. Yeah. Any other physicians out there hiding uh, dental checkups every six months, right? That's because they have more bills to pay than the doctors, you know, you go. <laughs> a physical, really, once a year or so. You know, I don't particularly like physicals. Anybody here a big fan of physicals besides the doctors? You know, I, I don't like particularly getting stuck for blood draws. I'm not afraid of needles. They, they don't bother me. But it's, it's not something that I say, oh boy, today I get to have a needle stuck in my arm. You know, it's just, it's not all that great. I, I don't enjoy filling out the little cards with the wooden sticks. Some of you are not getting physicals often enough. I can tell. You're missing something. 
I don't like fingers being put where fingers ought not to be put. You know? There's that whole thing. The whole physical seems like a rather invasive procedure that accomplishes very little when I'm already feeling just fine. Thank you. At least I was until I went in. Take off how much? Yeah. But I endure it. I endure it because, well, because, why do I endure it? Because somebody said, you need to do this every year. Okay, all right. A blood test, an x-ray, some probing, some sampling might be, might be a good idea. They, they might not find anything. Hopefully, they don't find anything. But at least it rules out some things and says, okay, it looks like you know, you're good to go for another year. If it's important for me to be examined physically every once in a while for my life here, how important would it be to have a spiritual that impacts my eternal life? Seems like it would be rather important, doesn't it? But we don't like to be examined. In the conference, they are talking again about pastoral evaluations. And when they bring up pastoral evaluations in the workers' meetings, in the pastors' meetings, the look on the face of the pastors is about the same as when we say, it's time for your next physical. They get just about as excited about it. But it's important. Adventists, uh, we have long taught that there's a close relationship between the physical and the spiritual aspects of our lives. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3.16, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, that God's Spirit lives in you? And we just turn the page over to, to 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. Do you not know, again, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. So honor God with your body. Our physical condition has a direct relationship to our spiritual condition. One can impact the other. One is even a a representation of the other in some ways, how we take care of ourselves. It's important. And then the same author writes in a different letter to the same church, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Wow. We need to have a spiritual to see if Jesus is in us. Because Jesus is in us unless unless we fail the test. Wow. Yeah, if, if that's really true, I want to volunteer for a spiritual. I want to know if there's something that I need to be doing so that Christ can fully live in me. You know, I don't think that God was impressed with me making sure my bike was shiny and not looking at the tire treads. I don't think he was impressed with that. I think he thinks that that was a waste of guardian angel time. That's something, he says, that I had to do for you that you could have done for yourself. And I was not pleased. And I don't think he is impressed either if I am focused on trying to make my ministry look good and trying to make our church look good, but we're not examining the intimacy of our moment-by-moment relationship with God. Intimacy of my moment-by-moment relationship with God. You can teach and live by all the 28. And that's great. But if you're doing that 
and you don't have the moment-by-moment daily relationship, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, it's for nothing. That's good, but that's not going to save you. Jesus is going to save you. And if you have the intimate relationship with Him, He's going to guide you through this, okay? Let's not get things turned around. The real question here is this, do you have an intimate spiritual relationship with God? How often do you think about your relationship with Jesus as being intimate? See, we've, like so many words in today's world, we've, we've taken that world and we've given it wrong connotations. Wrong connotations. God wants us to be intimate with Him. Is He living in you and through you? Do others literally see Jesus in you every day? Have the two of you become one flesh? That's what God wants. The Holy Spirit living in us, He wants a one flesh relationship with you. Last week, we looked at the greatest commandment, the greatest commandment. Love God with everything you've got, and love your neighbor as if it were God that you were loving. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor like you were serving God. Right after he says that, he goes into a, a, a talk with the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, and he doesn't mince words. Jesus gets very, very blunt here. You can read the whole thing in Matthew chapter 23. Let's just read part of it. Matthew 23, starting with the first verse. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, but he said it loud enough that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law could hear it. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. They are placed in positions of leadership in the church. So you need to obey them. You need to do everything that they tell you. You need to follow what they teach you. They've been given responsibilities. They are the leaders of the church, so you should pay attention, but don't do what they do because they don't practice what they preach. Now, of course, that was only true of leaders back then. Yeah. Not to follow man or to follow Jesus. Don't do what they teach, but don't do what they do. They tie up heavy loads, responsibilities, guilt to put on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for men to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. We came across this word in, in Christianity 101 today, tephalin, tephalin and phylacteries. These are the leather uh, boxes that they place on their forehead and wrap around and a leather box on their arm and they wrap it on, on their left hand and this is keeping the Word of God in their mind and in their hand and they do this with great show. If you go with us to Israel next time on the plane, you will see the men do this on the plane morning and evening. When you're, when you're by the, the western wall, you'll You'll see it. They're there. And these men, he says, that they make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted in the marketplaces and to have men call them rabbi. They love the attention. They love the focus. We skip over to verse 23. You can read all about these, these woes, the seven woes that are listed here in Matthew 23. But in verse 23, woe to you, teachers of the law 
and Pharisees, you hypocrites. There are a lot of things I want Jesus to call me. Hypocrite is not one of them. Hypocrite. You give a tenth of your spices. You pay tithe on your mint and your dill and your cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter, justice, mercy, and faithfulness, without neglecting the former. I'm not saying it's wrong to pay a faithful, minutely accurate tithe, but if you're doing that and you're getting rid of the greatest commandment, you blind guides, you will take your water and pour it through a strainer to strain out a gnat, which is the smallest of the unclean animals, but you'll swallow a camel. Don't tell me Jesus doesn't have a sense of humor. You'll swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Can you see the meaning here? Take care of the intimate relationship with Jesus, and he'll shine through. It'll be beautiful, not by your efforts, by his. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, they're full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. I care about what our church facility looks like. I want the landscapers to do a nice job. I want the flowers to look nice. I want the lawn to be cut. I, I want us to take care of this building. I care what our worship service looks like. We don't always every week get it absolutely perfect, but we work at it, and, and I love it when it just all comes together beautifully because it's important that people who are coming to worship here or watching on television or watching it on the internet, it's important that they see that we care about and, and put effort into our worship. It's something that is planned. But if it only looks good, and we're not having an intimate walk with Jesus that lasts with us throughout the week, what's, what's the point? Then it is just a show. The world's a sick place, isn't it? The world is a very, very sick place. And there's ample evidence for it. Just turn on the TV, pick up a newspaper, turn on the internet. And I fear that the church is not as healthy as it could be or as it should be. I will never be satisfied. We can always do more. That's not a guilt trip. I'm sharing that with you this morning because I care about your eternal destiny. I want you to have that intimate relationship with Jesus. I want him to be living in you and through you more than I want the worship service to look good because we're not going to get to heaven based on a grade given to our worship service. We're going to get to heaven by the Lord who is on that cross on Golgotha, who became our statue of liberty, our cross of liberty. The, health is not, the, the church is not as healthy as it could or should be, but there's a pill for that. Did you know that? There's a pill. It's called the gospel. <laughs> yeah? The gospel. Take it. Take two and call me in the morning. God so loved the world, especially you, that he sent his only son, the great physician, 
so that whoever would make an appointment with him and trust his diagnosis, prognosis, and follow his course of treatment, including a blood transfusion, would not die of their illness, but would live abundantly forever. The doctor is in. He's taking new patients. Hard to find a doctor willing to do that today. This doctor is taking new patients. He doesn't need your insurance, but he'll give you his assurance. He'll never keep you waiting. Listen, doctors, I'm talking to you. Never keep you waiting. There's no copay. No copay. He makes house calls. But do you really want to know what his diagnosis is? Do you want to be well, or do you just want to look good? Jesus asked the man by the pool of Bethesda who had been there for 38 years with his sign, with his cardboard sign that said, homeless, anything helps, God bless. And he was probably doing okay with that. And Jesus came up and said, do you want to be well? And I think he might ask us that question this morning. Do you want to be well? Well, that's fine, Pastor, but how does it happen? Let's take Jesus' words very simply. John 3, 3. To Nicodemus, he said, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. No one can see the kingdom of God unless you start all over from scratch, taking nothing with you. Matthew chapter 18, verses 3 and 4. Just run up to that with, with, with verse 2. He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Don't you want to be securely in a relationship with Jesus Christ? and know that you are among the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, then become childlike. Trust him implicitly with your care. Matthew 19, beginning with verse 13, Then little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Imagine that. Brought a little child up front, and the people said, Come on, we've already had children's story. It's our time now. Going to have a baptism next week. How old do you have to be to be baptized? Isn't there a rule somewhere that says you have to be 12? I know it's in the Bible. It must be in the Bible somewhere. Oh, well, it's a rule somewhere. I'm just, I'm just warning you. I'm going to baptize a young lady. She's not 12. But she's made a decision, and her parents can't talk her out of it. And so they brought them to me. And I tried to talk her out of it. But I did ask her, why? You're only eight. Don't you want to wait a little bit? No. What would happen if I died and I wasn't baptized. I said, well, you wait, you'd wake up and see Jesus. She wants to give her heart to God, and she wants to be baptized. Am I going to tell her no? No. I'd rather baptize her again later if I need to, if she wants to. I'd rather take her to Israel and baptize her in the Jordan River again. I'd rather do anything than turn her away and say, no, you're too young. No, you're too young. Jesus said, let the children come to me and don't hinder them. The kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. 
And when he had placed his hands on them, he blessed them. What do I want you to do? I want you to become children. I want you to surrender new all over to Jesus Christ and leave everything else behind. I want you to do that every day. I want you to simplify your relationship with Jesus. I want you to downsize it. I want you to demystify it. I want you to set aside your lists and your qualifications. And at the same time, I want you to give up your independence. I want you to give up your independence. The kind of independence that says, you know, I don't need to be bound by rules and standards that somebody else has placed on me. I don't need that, so I can do whatever I want to do or whatever I let God tell me to do. Now, I guarantee you, if you surrender to Christ as a child, He's going to tell you everything that you need to do, just like a little child. But just like a little child who's in the company of one that they know loves them and that they can trust, you'll do whatever he tells you to do. But you might find yourself getting rid of some things that you hadn't planned on getting rid of. What I need you to do, if you've got a a smartphone, is there anybody that doesn't have a smartphone? Wow. Two. If you've got a smartphone, I want you to set the uh, alarm or or something program in there that, that reminds you of an appointment for every hour during every day of the week. That could interfere with your week significantly. But something, just, just a little ding or a little vibration, something that reminds you every hour during the week that you need to do a quick spiritual check. Am I with Jesus? Am I with Jesus? Is Jesus with, is he with me right now? Remind yourself, Romans 12, 1 and 2, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. And don't be conformed to the world and all of their ways of busyness through the week, but be transformed, be changed, be converted by the renewing of your mind throughout the week. Keep it simple. It's not what you do. It's what you give up. And Jesus says, I want you to give up everything for me. And then see what happens. Please don't just go out of here and say, that was another good sermon, Pastor. Think of me. And when you think of me, then quickly negate that thought and think of Jesus. Remember it through the week. Remind yourself. Surrender yourself again and again and again through the week. And let's see what God wants to do in your life. God wants to change us. God wants to make this church not just the happiest church on earth. He wants to make us the most Christ-like church on earth. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your words. I thank you for your promises. I thank you for your presence with us. And you've promised that you will never leave us. You'll live in us. Lord, help us to allow that to happen. Help us to do more than make it look like that's happening. Help us to live like that's happening. Lord, we are your church. And as a church family, I lift us up to you. I thank you for the journey we've been on. I thank you for today, and I thank you for where you want to take us tomorrow. 
Help us to have ears to hear and eyes to see to allow you to speak and live through us. In Jesus' name, amen.